to thank the first ever color mind sponsor atlas vpn atlas vpn is one of the best and most affordable vpn services on the market today as i'm sure you've heard from many of your favorite youtubers which now includes me are you tired of feeling like you're being watched every time you go online worried about your privacy and security while browsing the internet well look no further than atlas vpn atlas vpn is a virtual private network that protects your online identity and keeps your personal data safe with Atlas VPN, you can connect to servers in over 30 countries, giving you protected access to the internet as if you were browsing from anywhere in the world. For example, you can use Atlas VPN to secure your online banking or shopping websites when you're using public Wi-Fi. Now you can safely put in your credit card info at that Starbucks when you're trying to get those dead stock J's on sneaker apps. You're not gonna get them, I'm sorry. This protects your sensitive information, such as your passwords and credit card information, from not only malware, but more importantly, from being intercepted by hackers. Or let's say you're traveling abroad and you want to watch your favorite TV shows from back home. You can use Atlas VPN to bypass geo restrictions and access streaming services like Netflix or Hulu. Now I can finally watch Power without having to get stars because <sighs> bills be billing. Bills certainly be billing. With their super easy to use mobile app, it couldn't be easier to secure your internet connection and protect your data on the go. Or cheaper as Atlas is offering a special three year, less than $2 a month plan with three months free, plus a 30 day money back guarantee. And I mean, at that price point, it's at least worth a try. There's a link in the description, click on it to protect your data and get the many benefits of Atlas VPN for a ridiculously low price. Grab Atlas VPN for less than $2 a month plus an extra three months free before the big deal ends. And once again, thanks to Atlas for sponsoring this segment. Now, let's get back to the show. Feel an ever consuming pit in your stomach for several years. It says you're not good enough even when you know you are. It tells you, but look at the data, you're a fuck up. You put on a good show, but you can never get across the finish line, can you? Always fucking up at the last step. Preheat the oven, forget to take out the stew. Does the dishes, does the mop the floor. Why did the Calc 2 equation, too bad you forgot to bring down the four three steps ago. Finally got the report in on time, proofread everything twice, but there's still a typo in the title. Just give up. Ignore it by excelling in school and everywhere except math, of course, just enough to please your teachers, but not enough to make your parents love you unconditionally. Learn in grad school that you got screened for ADHD as a toddler, but your parents were too working class and immigrant to know what to do with that information. Forget about this until you get out of grad school, even though it seems like a rather important life event. You forget many things though, so this isn't a total surprise. Go to your cool millennial auntie slash general practitioner with the ADHD checklist you took on the ADD.org site that I've linked down below. She'll ask you some questions based on what she's seen you answer on the chart, how it's impacting your work and home life, and then talk to you about how common ADHD diagnoses are being, which instinctively makes you defensive. Have her look at you confused for a second, then immediately back out of the whole thing. Tell her, I know, I just watched too many TikToks and actually I feel fine. I need to just stop being lazy and get my act together. I really should be focused more on eating and sleeping regularly. 
Internally, you always wonder why these two things are so hard for you, seeing as you love sleep and clearly you love food. But sometimes, more now that you've started your full-time job, you just can't get to bed on time, or when you do, your brain just won't shut the fuck up. It doesn't help that even though you love the idea of cooking, it stretches you out too much to even boil water for top ramen some days, so you have nothing but hot pockets in the fridge and fruit wrappers on the counter. Wait, fuck, have I been talking too long? How much time has passed? Ah, oh, God, I did it again. She'll stop you, say it's fine, if she explains what she's seen from the test you took and the conversation you've had. In the end, she'll write you a prescription. It'll feel like God giving Moses the commandments to take back down the mountain. Act normal, nigga. She'll say, now go to your pharmacy and they'll give you the medication. So you go to the pharmacy. Then another one. And then another one. This one is out of your prescription as well, but they think they'll have it in after the weekend, so you take it. And as you're sitting down there, waiting, you think, it shouldn't be this hard to get help, right? And now, sports. Sipping on a stranger to stay higher. Working memory, I be too tired. My figure, my head, or my measure, my pants, your connects, so I'm striving like I'm Giovanna. Bitch, check, money, check, look at Spencer, yeah. Don't check, goddamn, when my keychain not. Out of sight, out of mind, I'll be late again. Lost my shit, lost my mind, left my keys again. Where my keys again, keys again. Where my keys again, keys again. Where my keys again, keys again. Lost my keys again. Send the Addy. If marriage and want a man is the devil's lettuce, then let Adderall be their Starbucks espresso order. Adderall is what rich people think having a productive Sigma grind set personality is like. Adderall is how I like to prep for a 2 p.m. afternoon nap after downing 16 ounces of sugar-free Red Bull and a bump of ketamine. Okay. Adderall is stimulant medication used to treat ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It does this by helping improve cognition function or basically how brain work in the prefrontal cortex area, which is somewhere around here. The prefrontal cortex plays an integral role in things like impulse control, memory, and attention. So when I take my Adderall in the morning, here's basically what happens. As I take my pills, the mixed amphetamine salts in my body get broken down. They travel down my bloodstream, trying to make moves to get into the party of my mind, which is best to think of it as a big house party with a bunch of goings on and, and literally everything's lit. In about 30 minutes to an hour, they pull up at my house, hop out their 2014 Hyundai Sonata, and approach my neuron receptors. Neuron receptors are like these little things that help you do the most important things in life, which is feel shit and do things. Bruh. Like subscribe to the channel, or like the video, or, you know, donate to my Patreon. It's only four months, you motherfucker. A better way to think of them is that they're kind of like these little people at the door that open and close when special molecules called neurotransmitters approach them and knock on them. When the doors open, they let out a special signal that tells the brain what to do and how to feel. So your brain's a house party and the neuroreceptors are the homies at the door that let people in or out. The guests that are trying to get into the party, we can call those your neurotransmitters. They're the guests at the party who come knock on the door. Or let's be real, because it's not 2013 anymore, they text you that they're outside. When you take Adderall, the drug works by increasing the levels of certain neurotransmitters in your brains, principally dopamine and norepinephrine. These are basically the main chemicals in your brain that are used for motivation, for you to be able to get things that you want to get done, done. When more of it is released in your brain, it allows your brain to focus and choose to dedicate more mental resources at the task at hand. And that's because as neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine are really good at regulating focus, attention, and mood. It's believed that people with ADHD have chronically under aroused brains and that stimulants like Adderall, Vyvanse, and Ritalin help by increasing our basal arousal levels. Generally, more dopamine translates to a greater feeling of reward. When your dopamine levels are high, you just feel 
good. One way to measure this is called the tonic dopamine level, which is how much dopamine is kind of hanging out between your neurons already. But there's also phasic dopamine, which is what your neurons release based on a stimulus. Anything from finishing your PhD thesis to noticing a pretty bird outside your window. Both kinds of dopamine levels are important because they affect each other. If you have a lot of tonic dopamine, for example, it can make the phasic response smaller. Neurons get a signal that there's already a lot of dopamine outside the cell, so they don't have to release as much when they try to send a signal to the next neuron. ADHD seems to do the opposite. People with the disorder seem to have lower levels of tonic dopamine, meaning that phasic responses are bigger. You might think that a bigger reward would be a good thing because it would increase your motivation, but that's not what happens. The low arousal theory says that since there's so much less dopamine sitting between your neurons, you need much more stimulation to get it flowing the way that it would in someone without ADHD. Basically, according to low arousal theory, because ADHD brains have lower tonic or base dopamine levels, they also generate a lot less motivational energy. And they in turn have a lower phasic dopamine response, which means both it is harder to want to get things done, and then once you do get those things done, you don't feel the same sense of satisfaction from doing it. A double whammy. And so the body ends up trying to constantly chase new sources of dopamine of interest because it's bored. And boredom more than anything is a response from your body to tell you do something, anything, fuck. So Adderall ends up giving me a little bit more extra juice in the tank in order to dedicate more time to the things that I want to do to help me stay focused and not have my brain going haywire all the time because it naturally just isn't able to generate enough interest juice to keep me interested on, to keep me interested on things that I actually really do want to be interested in. With this extra juice in the tank, I feel more in control. Like I, have a lot of energy, but for once I can actually throw it in the way that I want towards the things that I love or the things that I need, that I know that I need to take care of. I don't zone out in convos anymore because I'm not constantly looking for something else slightly more interesting or something isn't really interrupting my ability to focus on what this person is saying. The way I can actually explain it is that, and it sounds more harsh, but you know, when I started taking Adderall, I, I started realizing that conversations weren't supposed to be so hard to get through that uh i guess everybody else is just able just to look a person straight in the face and just like hear what they're saying and not get distracted by their lips moving or like how their eyeshadow like kind of compliments their dress stuff like that one underrated thing is that i don't forget what i accomplished during the day people with adhd as you might know by now suffer from poor working memory and i think a shadow effect of that is that i can i go through a lot of days in which I definitely feel like I've been running around a lot, but when someone asks me, hey, what'd you do today? I always end up bashing myself because I can't remember what I did. So I don't feel like I got enough done because I don't feel accomplished and I don't remember what I did accomplish. When I'm consistently taking my medication, I realize that not only am I getting more done, but I'm remembering what I did and I know what I did was important. So I feel more accomplished at the end of the day. This ends up creating a feedback loop of decreasing anxiety, decreasing dread, and increased self-confidence because I now have more belief in myself to get the everyday things of life done. That I am not constantly working super hard just to get to level zero where most people are chilling at. And that's what I'm happy for. That's why I continue to take it when I can. <laughs> So there are three main factors that are contributing to the Adderall shortage in the United States. We have demand, we have regulatory issues, and then we have the supply chain. Let's break them down one by one. There's been an increase in demand of Adderall over the past couple of years because, well, there's been an increase in people getting diagnosed with ADHD, which as Dr. Craig Sermon, professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School says, is mostly due to increased awareness. I think the biggest factor is awareness that ADHD exists. And as one of the interviewees mentioned, uh, it's really only in the last 15 to 20 years that adult ADHD has been a concept that's diagnosable. So we should be seeing rising rates of diagnosis and treatment. I think it's reasonable to see that as people have gotten more comfortable talking about ADHD and talking about their experiences, that we've also seen a rise in people who are also looking at those uh, symptoms and those life experiences that are saying, hey, that he, he just like me for real. 
Globally, do I think that there's more ADHD? I don't know. No, I don't. I think it's a neurodevelopmental thing. It's, I think it's probably steady. But I think that people are becoming more aware of it. So I think that maybe from that population that was previously undiagnosed, we're starting to pull more from that. I won't lie, for me, I got diagnosed going on about three years now, like right in the kind of beginning of the pandemic. Um, those who are not new to the channel have, have heard me tell my story about this before in my How I Caught the Ah DHD video. Something I guess I didn't mention as much in that video was that yeah, it was, uh, you know, reels and TikToks and people talking about their experiences that sort of started to jiggle my brain a little bit and say, hey, maybe there is a word for the way that I've also that I've always felt in my life, which is, you know, weirdly late to things, even when I try my best. Uh, this ever filling pit of laziness because I can never just do the things I said I was going to do even when I promised them to myself or even when they're things that I really want to do. I just thought that was just me being a loser. But to know that other people also felt this way and they were also confused by it made me want to look into it more. The second one is regulatory issues. Now the Drug Enforcement Administration, also known as the DEA, placed strict regulations on the production of drugs that contain amphetamines, including Adderall. The reason the DEA cares so much about the production and distribution of drugs like Ritalin or Adderall is because most ADHD drugs are classified as Schedule II substances. Now according to the DEA, Schedule II drugs, substances, or chemicals are defined as drugs with a high potential for abuse, with use potentially leading to severe psychological or physical dependence. These drugs are considered dangerous. And examples of Schedule II drugs would include Vicodin, cocaine, methamphetamine, methadone, Oxycontin, fentanyl, and Adderall. So if you're already getting prescriptions for ADHD meds, you'll notice that this is why most of your scripts are not for longer than 30 days most times. An interesting fact to note is that mixed amphetamine salts were originally classified as Schedule 3 drugs. The Schedule 3 drugs are substances like Tylenol with codeine, ketamine, anabolic steroids, and testosterone. So I guess it's more dangerous to have ADHD than to be a man. The DEA ended up reclassifying uh, mixed amphetamines as Schedule II drugs in 2001 due to the fact that they were more likely to be misused and abused. This change is a result of the growing popularity of using the drug as a party drug or as a cognitive enhancer. As we discussed earlier in the video, Ritalin and Adderall, Vyvanse, these are all stimulants and stimulants do have a potential to be abused, especially when they're not being used under the supervision of a doctor. Since these medications work by stimulating the areas of the brains that can help with behavior and thought, uh, when people who don't have ADHD take this, they can also get more activity in their brain to make them more focused or uh, more alert. I've had college students who tell me instead of studying, they were counting every uh, hair on their arm because the dose was too high. All these factors combined with the increased pressure to do well in higher education for diminishing returns has led to a, a common epidemic nowadays in which college age students tend to abuse stimulant medication thinking that it will help improve their grades or improve their workflow, which is dumb because it doesn't. Dr. Wyant is a professor of psychology at the University of Rhode Island and researching how college students use ADHD drugs is a big area of focus for her. So she ran a study where a group of college students without ADHD performed a bunch of cognitive tests, one time through with ADHD meds and another time through with a placebo pill. But did the drugs improve their cognition? actually did not improve their memory. It impaired their short-term memory. It had no effect on their reading comprehension or on their ability to organize, plan, um, think strategically. Please, please, please stop taking my drugs. Just get cocaine instead. Third and last big reason I want to talk about for the Adderall shortage in this country is supply chain disruptions. As we talked about in our inflation video, supply chains are very complex and if any parts of them go wrong, it can often end up in delays to the final customer. The COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting Vive session has caused disruptions to global supply chains, including the pharmaceutical industry, which has led to shortages of many medications from ibuprofen to morphine to, of course, Adderall. 
So the supply chain is really could, could be either the production of the medicine. So if there's an issue with the facility, if they have shortages in the components, or that if the actual company or, or uh, the location where uh, the medication is made, if there's issues of staffing or labor shortages or any other issues that, that slows down production at the site, then uh, you're going to experience it as, as a as a user end user or patient. There have been a myriad of issues with the manufacturing process for Adderall, including problems with sourcing raw materials and difficulty in meeting quality control standards, which have contributed to the shortage, which is pretty understandable. The DEA says most manufacturers have plenty of supply and have not fully hit their supply quota for three years. Wait, so there, there might not even be a shortage? I hate this fucking timeline. The Adderall shortage says a lot more about our healthcare system than it does about the health of the people that desperately need that care. All this keep a planner, get a label maker, have you tried mindfulness is bullshit. I bought a mind my foot in your ass and call it cranberry stuffing. I don't know why I wrote that joke either. They don't care, or at least they seem uninterested in trying to because they don't know what it's like. At the end of the day, besides all of the TikToks, besides all of the scare tactics, besides all of the discourse, we need to want neurodivergent people to succeed in the world that we have now. And that's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the way that neurotypical people think of neurodiverse people as problems. We have to want people with ADHD people with autism, people with BPD, people with bipolar disorder. We have to want them to succeed. We have to want to see them happy, not just expect it, not just hope they're going to do it on their own. We have to want to help. And if that means medication, it means medication, but it also means treatment. It also means access. It also means empathy. It means socially engineering a world that is open to the idea that other people think differently. And that that's okay, and maybe not even okay, maybe preferred. No offense, but anytime any of y'all talk about the Adderall shortage, you sound like a bunch of insane addicts. Can you imagine if I was like, I can't smoke weed, this is going to be the catalyst of the worst mental health crisis in American history. Like, it's weird, take a tea break. Unmedicated ADHD is why my bachelor's degree took seven years. Being medicated for it is the only reason I am able to do my job. Adderall isn't some party drug to people with executive function disorders. <laughs> the cool thing about the Adderall shortage is that people who don't actually need it will remember to call the pharmacy every day to ask about stock, and those who do need it won't be able to remember to call and ask. So the Adderall shortage is kind of like if every five minutes someone made you play Russian roulette with a revolver loaded with 10 minutes of productivity, an hour of repeatedly forgetting why you walked into that room, and five hours of rebuilding the same house in Minecraft. Why would you, why would you say that? Why would you say something so bold? It's so brave. So what is the significance of this Adderall shortage on people with ADHD? Because it's bigger than just my keys, right? It's about all the stress that looking for my keys causes. How that stress makes me miss my right turn because now I'm running late to my appointment. How that stress builds up in my body and ends up keeping me up at night when that is time that my body should be taking to repair itself while it sleeps, meaning that I get much less sleep. It's about the empty time in my memory, like edited clips where I can't remember where I should have been or what I was doing. And that's so frustrating, not only to experience, but to talk about. Because you can't just say this stuff. It doesn't scare people, it annoys them. It tells them you need to figure your shit out. Take an Ambien and pack your keys in your lunch like everybody else. But pardon my fucking French, but I think it sucks to feel like I have to have my guts strewn out across the floor just for someone to consider that I might have a tummy ache. Mm -hmm. What I do want to start opening the conversation more up to is like understanding what life is like with, with a person that is like neurodivergent. Do, uh, I forgot, are you, do you have ADHD or, um, and do you, <laughs> 
There we go, right? I, I've been I, I've I've been seeing these fucking uh <clears throat> I think the academic term is brain dead. Uh <laughs> I've, I've just been seeing these like stupid takes by people on Twitter being like, Yeah, if you have ADHD, like take amphetamines as if that's really gonna help. Like, yeah, dude. Dude, that, that, well, that's I, what they're I, for. <laughs> that's what it's the FDA insanely, likes it for. Difficult to explain to somebody that like my brain can't produce chemicals that make like any routine or work or anything feel good unless I have this drug in my body. Like I'm living in constant mundane misery if there isn't something triggering those things in my brain. So to say like, oh, you're on amphetamines, you're fucking up your brain. It's like if I wasn't on ADHD meds, I probably would be a lot more suicidal. Like I probably would have been a lot more suicidal at a million different points in my life because it's like it's. It's like your brain is off all the time. It's awful, but it's like you don't have any control of it. It's really, really bad. The reason why I'm making this video is because I think it's bigger than some pills or a couple calls to pharmacies. We need to change the way that we talk and the way we think about how brains think. It, it, I, it, it'll be different. It'd be interesting to see you know, like what my what my son experiences. My son now, for lack of a better word, putting it, understands that he's ADHD right and then he's growing up in a world where there's a whole adhd talk versus like niggas like me like i'm 40. i'm just realizing this in my late 30s and 40s mm. you know what i'm saying i was on the way to getting a diagnosis before i started youtube i was like i was in my doctor's office like hey i think i'm dealing with adhd because i'm really struggling at work um and keeping focused and and et cetera et cetera he's like okay well let's try this this is and this and then like a couple of weeks later bo burnham happened oh what's me fuck it it works <laughs> i think the conversation that we're trying to have now is not even whether or not uh we can help people who have who are who are neuro atypical right it's that like the way our brains work work they, they 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 have their own method to their madness in the same way that truthfully when i look at neurotypical people i'm like the way you're doing it is bad like i i, I don't <laughs> understand it right that's why i'm doing it another way ultimately you have now found a place in which like your adhd tendencies the way your brain works is to an advantage right and right. It, it would especially the video essay genre mm -hmm. like oh my god i was talking to cj to x and we both agreed like it's very clear that the way our minds work was built for this uh, medium. Mm. Because I watch a CJ to X video and the world stops, right? I turn CJ to X on around my wife and she throws stuff at me. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, turn this off. I don't understand what's happening. He's talking so He's fast. He's talking so fast. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, he's not talking fast at all. He clearly this just said, wrong, this, 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 this. What are you not getting? Um, something you might want to look into is the concept of medicalization. Have you have you heard about that? Why do some things become disorders and not others? Medicalization <laughs> refers to the process by which a condition or behavior is defined and treated as a medical problem, even if before it was considered a normal part of the human experience. It involves shifting the focus of individual differences from social, cultural, or psychological factors to medical causes and treatments. Medicalization is probably like the next big wave of um, influencing policy. As we, as people are starting to, well, as much as policy will get influenced under, you know, our current social structure, because sometimes it's like, fuck these people, um, which is I'm pretty sure is what the rest of the video is about. Uh, but if if policy were to do its job well, what research is starting to show is that the problem isn't necessarily with neuroatypicals or with aging or uh bodily functions um so on and so forth the problem is that we have medicalized society mm -hmm. so that we have through medicine created a standard of behavior that everybody is supposed to be adhered to and if you can't adhere to the standard we have drugs for you and then you can function in society effectively and what people are starting to think about is Instead of creating one, a, uh, uh, you know, an industrial complex around medicine and around healthcare, which is not person centered and person focused. My homeboy 
father, my homeboy's uh, father died, and then he got divorced in like a two year. Uh, and then and then he had a huge a huge amount of work turmoil. Medicalization says you're depressed and you have a brain imbalance, etc. Whereas like a, the anti medicalization movement says you went through a lot of shit, bro. You're supposed to feel like how you're feeling. And although we can still help and provide resources for you to function in the world, we don't want to stigmatize the fact that you're having a very natural response to hard life right now. You may think that this is only something that doctors or public health professionals focus on, but we can see medicalization happening in our everyday lives. Consider shyness. While shyness is a normal personality trait, I mean, I'm told anyway, I've been told that I personally have the personality of a fire truck increasingly it has been medicalized as social anxiety disorder which is characterized by having excessive fear or anxiety in social situations this has led to the development of medications and treatments for social anxiety disorder which some argue may be overdiagnosed and over medicated arguing that shyness may not necessarily be a disorder that requires medical intervention sometimes like i i, I just don't want to be bothered <laughs> And so like, it's, it's a dangerous, they haven't worked out all the kinks, right? Because we don't want to, the, the flip side of medicalization is none of you are actually sick. You don't need medicine. You don't need support. You just need to work hard, meditate and whatever else. Um, so like, we don't want to go that far. <sighs> okay. There's nothing necessarily wrong with medicalization. It's nice to provide language to a set of shared symptoms so that they can be carefully studied and treated so that those people have a fair shot at experiencing life to its fullest potential especially when we're talking about the youth that that's the thin line i'm i guess i'm kind of walking here right because the thing that i'm trying to go back to again and again and again and it's difficult because we haven't had the, the level a lot of people haven't had that level one level zero conversation of like hey people with different brain chemistries are valuable and normal and like we don't need to section them off because after that we then have to say all right how comfortable are we using these drugs as a reactive measure to not fitting into an old system right that's a scary thing because you there's still consequences you know right. there's consequence my sons i just we just had a um conference for my son literally right before this started my son was was not on any meds um until this this school year and every year my son is is fucking amazing right like he was preemie um he <laughs> he doesn't realize it but he watched uh steven universe when he was like five and he's been trying to be steven universe ever since to his detriment even he's just huh. the sweetest most like high character we're all going to be friends we're all going to get along we're all going to do the right thing type of boy um and it was heartbreaking to me because he was in every remediation class he was in tutoring he was going to outside um uh, therapy for his uh he had a, 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 a visual processing issue um he was doing all these things and we did all this work to get him into this great school with all these extracurricular things. He couldn't do none of that because he was only doing remediation for reading and writing and math. The whole, for, for three years, plus kindergarten, right? And I would, and then during like COVID, like we have all this work and I would watch him struggle through his work, like tears in his eyes, forcing himself to finish stuff that I could tell it was not like a lack of acumen. It was I'm looking at this paper and the words are now all over this way mm. and I can't and I can't do it. And I'm like, I right, come back, come back, come back, come back to us. Whatever, right. And, you know, we couldn't afford. I'm, I know there's neurodivergent schools. I, I know those schools exist. They cost thirty thousand dollars a year. We don't have that. We didn't have that. We don't have that now, even with, with YouTube money. And so he struggled. He worked like three times as hard as his peers to just stay just above, um, you know, re remediation. And then he got on meds this year and now he's exceeding. Hmm. And, and like and now he's in theater and he's got his first play next week. You know what I'm saying? 
And so it's like there's there's a consequence to not participating in society as it's built as a neurodivergent person. You know what I mean? And so like I would love to for a world to exist where he didn't need drugs that increased the, the dopamine level in his brain. But I prefer right now that he doesn't cry every night doing homework and and never have time to play Minecraft and never be able to, you know, we're in, we're in soccer now. Like he couldn't have done that last year. But the danger of medicalization is that it can enable authorities to think of neurodiversity as an individual problem that can be fixed with science rather than an indication of what the fabric of society actually looks like so that social norms can be adapted to make normal actually be representative of what most people are like. Let's say for the sake of argument that with any more medicalized society, the acceptance of forgetfulness among a particular population of people goes down. People just aren't on CP time anymore. No one's taking any shit. No, no one likes when you're late anymore, even by 15 minutes. And as a result of this, that population of people grow up more conscious of their forgetfulness and end up seeing their doctors more often and probably sooner than they would have done in a previous generation. Many might even meet the new cutoff point for chronic forgetfulness and receive a diagnosis even though they would have been considered just fine 10 years ago. Once they're prescribed treatment, that's gonna increase their healthcare use, which is going to strengthen the medicalization of their symptoms, which reinforces the diagnoses as a medical concept so that more people seek it out and you, you get it. It, it. it ends up being a cycle. The question is though, how satisfied are we with the current solutions to these problems? Do we think we should continue to help people numb themselves into succeeding in society, or should we maybe aim to shift systems in a way that makes those symptoms less serious or detrimental in engaging in community at large? It seems we have a social predilection towards treating human problems as individual or clinical, whether it's obesity, substance abuse, learning difficulties, aging, or alcoholism rather than addressing the underlying causes for complex social problems and human suffering. It is encroaching upon being more, you know, in, our, in the classic critical theory, you know, uh, uh, framework of like, why should a person, why should we expect a person who has went through all these things to function in the same way as their peers who are not? You know what I'm saying? And, and how do we better frame how do we better integrate that person's needs into the greater society versus saying you need to be sectioned off um diagnosed um so on and so forth and you have to fit into these roles before we before you can participate in society effectively you know what I'm saying? Maybe it makes no sense that we're expected to sit in a blank room for eight hours a day and just be okay with it. Maybe it doesn't make that much sense that not making eye contact labels you as a dishonest or weird person. Neurodivergent people have always existed in humanity. They're a bug, not a feature. What? Nope. Wrong way. Wrong way. Wrong way. <laughs> Neurodivergent people have always existed in humanity. They're not a bug. They're a feature. And if neurotypical people started to act like it, we could empower an entire population of thinkers that think differently, bring new perspective, new breath into a world that is quickly crumbling around us. That thinking outside the box and, and coming up with new ideas and creative solutions, that tends to be stuff that those of us that ADHD are really good at, but don't necessarily give ourselves credit for, because those things are things that actually require being distracted. Hmm, it's almost like hope and innovation are generated through divergent thinking. Oh my God, that's what the movie was about. Ah, ha, ha. The, test the test didn't work on you. They call it divergent. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in the US, we are taught that neurodivergent bodies are broken, are flawed, and that they need to be fixed or even worse, phased out. To the point that even when I succeed, imposter syndrome still slithers around my ear whispering, it will be easier for someone else with a normal brain. If you weren't so lazy, you wouldn't even view this as an accomplishment. There's this comedian, Gary Gullman, who has a, spe a special called The Great Depression about like this multi-year like depressive episode he had. Um, and he was talking about his experience with antidepressants and electroshock therapy. And he was talking about people talking to him about side effects. And it, it's really funny because people would tell, the, the joke he did was people would tell him, you know, like there are side effects, like you can get like fevers and stuff like that. And he would, he would just like have to say, you know what a side effect of depression is? 
killing myself. <laughs> so I'm gonna take like some hot flashes. <laughs> like people think that the neurodivergent experience is something singular from the experience of depression, um, which it isn't as somebody who's deals with multiple types of neurodivergency in my brain. Um, it's really, really linked with depression and anxiety um, and hopelessness and all these other things. So treating, getting to the core of that and treating the thing that makes all of these other things stronger, that being my ADHD, um, makes me not want to die sometimes. So it's like, it's very important. And I, it frustrates me that people are so quick to to dismiss it. Even before I got diagnosed with ADHD, I was doing drugs regardless, right? I was like, <laughs> to be honest with you, and like, even without yeah. getting into the the other ones, like coffee, that's one. Yeah. I was, I, I'm downing like four cups of coffee a day. And like for years, I was like, you know, that is just the way that my brain must work. You know, I literally felt that that one um, Dexter's laboratory uh, scene where the where the parents drink the coffee and then they, they like they like turn you do like a magical girl transformation to themselves. I was like, yeah, you know, like that that, that, that is must how that m must work. By our tendencies to seek medical solutions for social problems, we medicalize social issues such as inequity, queerness, particularly transness, and abnormality to the point that we focus the majority of our efforts to solving the issue on an individual level. And that ain't it, Chief. Undoubtedly, our risk aversion to be disabled is socially constructed, and our eagerness to find conditions that may result in disability is also socially constructed. But by only focusing on that, on that social construction, we miss investigating who is being labeled disabled and what the system, what the healthcare system does to them accordingly. Super late into the production for this video, I saw an amazing essay from Hyphenated History that touched upon this. It's an amazing video in general, so you, if you, especially if you want to continue this discussion, go watch that after this and, and subscribe and like it and all the, yeah, it, oh, it's so good, so good. 90% of prisoners are estimated to be dealing with a mental health disorder and 13% of the overall prison population is black while we only make up two to 3% of the UK population. However, CCGs tend to not prioritise provision for people leaving prison, custody or those on probation. Those working in the criminal justice system have varying access to mental health training and in prisons, mental health training and care is generally lacking. As far as youth offending goes, children from racialised minorities are less likely than their white counterparts to access traditional mental health provisions, but are twice as likely to access mental health support via court orders, via either the social care system or the criminal justice system. In 2020, 32% of the child prison population were black. So with all this context, how do we go about making any of this shit better? Because right now, they're using the excuse of people who have addictions who are using drugs that are addictive right um as a as an excuse to attack neurodivergent people and i i think we should we should take it as antagonistic we shouldn't pretend like it's just oh oh it's just some passive little thing because these systems do not care about us so then you ask okay so what is a society that includes neurodivergence more efficiently look like. I think the first thing is that the way we deal with work and school changes. And I think work is already getting there. School, not at all. Like work, you know, working from home, um, uh, non-traditional work weeks. The decriminalization of drugs is a necessary step in neurodivergent people being treated humanely. I have um, a slightly more more radical take which is i just think all drugs should be uh completely decriminalized and most of them should be provided free of charge to include the drugs of abuse so that we can ensure a safe supply and then if you address all the other systemic issues some people are going to use drugs and i don't really give a shit like i'd rather you get clean drugs free and have a place to stay and food to eat and that just be your life and then you know you're like 0.001% of the population and i don't really care if x number of tax dollars goes to that if it means everybody else is okay 
right? Like you're going to, you're going to use drugs in a self-destructive way anyway, and we're going to provide you with resources to get better if you want to. But like, I think the government should just supply heroin for free. <laughs> like that's my take. I guess like less strict deadlines on things. I think also, um, a lot more communication and transparency as far as um, like due dates and expectations and, you know, basically breaking things down into really easily digestible um, chunks. Uh, let's see. I think, oh, the big one for me is allowing for like non-standard ideas of what it looks like to be paying attention the idea that if i'm doing shit with my hands or i'm not looking at you uh that i'm not listening to you because i'm autistic like i have to fucking perform listening which makes me listen worse because that's something that i actually when i was a graduate student i got in trouble for this um i was in a like department meeting with the english department and they were like meeting with all the grad students to like figure out, you know, what can we do to better serve you as our students? And one of the professors was talking and I was doodling while I was listening because it helps me listen when I can, you know, do something with my hands. And she called me out on it and was like, oh, Zoe, you want to share what you're, what you're drawing over there? All right. Okay. You're but a like, grown woman. Like, yeah. And if, I mean, if I were the person that I am now, I would have been. Off. Yeah. Lower I would benefit greatly if we moved away from a society that viewed productivity in the way that it does right now. The expectation that you should be the same amount of productive on any given day. Because there's days where I can do a fuck ton of work and there's days where I can do two hours maybe if I'm lucky. Mm. Right. And the rest of that day is on is in bed. That's that's the reality of that. My take, I don't fucking know. I'm not a healthcare professional. I just wanted to say that that something ain't right with this shit, but off the top of my head, take out a roll off a of schedule too, because what the fuck? Increase the availability of cognitive behavioral therapy and other brands of therapy at heavily, if not free, rates. We we just we just gotta we just gotta do something because I'm struggling. But I have a question for you, and let's talk about it in the comments. What's one societal rule or cultural norm would you personally want to change that you think would make the world more neurodivergent friendly? <laughs> uh, just turning, like turning off from social engagement. So, like one mm. of the one of the run, running jokes about me, like so, my wife, we're we're, we're not a couple to an extent, right? Um, and so she likes company, and I like company, right? And then there's a moment that hits where I don't like company anymore. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> it's like so, the, when, the, when the battery hits, the battery is It's gone. a wrap. Like, so like literally the running joke is at a certain point, FD is going to leave and go upstairs and either take a nap or play video games. And he is done. And it's not to be rude. There's no disrespect. It's I'm, I'm done. I can't do this. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I'm out. And like, literally, I will like, it, it, it was funny when it started, when it first started happening, everybody was confused because it's that's not a normal thing to do. I feel so seen. Um, well, I mean, I think that the answer is different depending on, you know, it is a very individual answer. So for my particular brain, what I would love is uh, for like time to be different uh, for... <laughs> For the the way that time constrains a lot of the way that we do things, I would love for that to be different. So not having like regular business hours would be great. Like if I want to respond to an email at two o'clock in the morning, I should be allowed to respond to an email at two o'clock in the morning and not have that be like a faux pas. Right. Um, if I want to like, if I want my normal work hours to be from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m., I should be allowed to do that. And like, especially now that we live in this like global world. Exactly. I'd personally make it the norm to constantly cut in and like summarize what a person is saying while you're in conversation with them. I just feel like if I could do that without feeling like, oh, I'm, I'm taking up too much space in the conversation, I'd retain so much more information. 
Uh, like I really like conversations where we're just going in and out and people are repeating back to me what I said so I know what they're retaining so I know where to go with the story. I don't know. Uh, but like what's one thing you would personally change if you had the power like within like social norms or like within like culture, I guess, in generally to make the world more ADHD friendly? It's it's like it would be a societal upheaval of like response to failure because everything is built for jobs and so so when everything is built for jobs then the idea is if you fail you get fired or you hurt somebody and so that's like the ultimate life-ending thing because if you get fired for bad work or for hurting somebody at a job you maybe become unemployable or you become a liability or all of these things um and it's just not the case most of the time when you fuck up even astronomically at a job or something nobody gets hurt and it's just like maybe they lose five bucks that day <laughs> like it's it's really like not a huge deal unless you're like working at a small business in which case you probably have a closer relationship with the person running the business and they're not going to be super pissed at you um it's it's a really really uh arbitrary you know emphasis on like failure and um, for people who are neurodivergent, failure is like, you know, it can be way more intense for them. Um, and myself included, I, I don't like getting things wrong, but it's mostly that like, socially, I've been coded since I was very young to when I make a mistake, it's indicative of, well, your brain just isn't really the right one for this. Especially Rather than like a thing that is necessary for you to get yeah. your brain to be right. good at something. Yeah. Yeah. Additionally, um, because of how, weighted and like heavily important grades are for progression if you fail at a assignment or at a test you're fucked they fuck you in the learning process which is awful because imagine imagine if when you were playing the tutorial for a video game if you died they would refund the game <laughs> Like it would be uninstalled from your console. It doesn't make any sense because, of course, the tutorial section for a game is to meant to get you up to speed with all these things. And then when you fail later in a part of the game, you reload at a checkpoint and you go and you attempt that thing again until you've worked up the skill to get it down. So this idea of taking a test once and you fail it and you lose all of the opportunity to ever progress on that material, same thing with an assignment, is gener genuinely like the worst possible thing you could do for kids. And the more that I think about all of the teachers who just um, tacitly accepted it and just like sat back and just worked with this system and just watched kids fail over and over again without caring about it, the more I lose respect for those people. We need to make sure that we are providing not only a safe space, but that every single possible tool that we have is provided to neurodiverse people because we're people too. We're your friends, your family, your neighbors. And just like you, all we wanna do is get around in these little cars that we call our life. Because that's the thing. I can't get by with just drive. I'm gonna need the keys too. And as always, be kind.